This time on the Highland Woodworker. Deep in the hills of East Tennessee, master woodworker Scott DeWard makes beautiful furniture designs like these in his straw bale workshop. It's a terrific shop. It heats and cools really well, and it's just really comfortable. Hear how his current project might just open the door for aspiring artists to the craft. So I need to pay a little attention to an unlikely place. Plus, Popular Woodworking Magazine pulls up a stool and has an important tip for finishing the piece. These stories and more, this time on the Highland Woodworker. Hello, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker. I'm excited to tell you about something that's brand new. We just launched the Highland Woodworker Online Classes. It's a membership program that allows you to learn from some of the best woodworking teachers anytime, anywhere, with the convenience of your computer or mobile device. Enjoy both live and recorded classes, plus our Learn From the Masters archives, which will give you access to some of the best tips and inspiration we have received in our 10 seasons of The Highland Woodworker. Learn more about how to become a member at highlandwoodworking.com. While you are there, see the vast selection of fine tools Highland Woodworking carries and can deliver straight to your door. They've been doing that since 1978. Scott DeWard makes the complex look simple and clean. Whether it's his gorgeous furniture design for a home or for a house of worship, Scott's well-rounded craftsmanship always shines through. Let's go to his East Tennessee home and unique workshop and spend a moment with a master. Scott DeWard, what a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Nice to see you. And this, I can tell, is the home of a craftsman. Uh, everything is a project and has your artistic touch. Tell me about it. Well, we bought the home in 97 and it was a project to begin with and it's still a project, but it is coming along great. And um, I think that you know a, a craftsman's home, we, we just want them to be a reflection of the kind of work that we do. Yeah, well, i tell you what, really made me zero in on your work was, uh, I was part of in visiting a show, the Masters Show uh, that we have here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're a big part of that. And uh, the pieces you had there had a clean look that were different from uh, the work that uh, a lot of people produce, just very clean. And I wondered how you did it. And I wanted to come here today and check that out. Uh, tell me about these doors. Well, uh, yeah, this, this was a window here originally. Uh, and so we wanted to have a much more open house. And so I designed a couple of double doors here and a screen door on a slider. And um, this, this actually does show a couple of things here that aren't apparent. Um, the, the interior doors, uh, I wanted to be real consistent with the grain on the styles, okay? And so the face of the styles then and the rails are resawn. So I build up a core because it's, it's really difficult to find timbers of that size and that thickness, the, the quality and consistency and color that you want. Um, and I can show you a bit more of that when we get down to the shop. And at the exterior ones, the, uh, the screen doors, those are solid timbers and I wanted to have a little natural edge on that. And you'll notice here a couple of pins up here. This is the draw bore right. technique. What a beautiful setting here, Scott. Um, the rolling hills, this is East Tennessee really at its best. And all around we've got the interest of of the homeowner, of, of you and your wife. Got bees, mm -hmm. natural areas, flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, th this is just great. And we're coming upon uh, a little bit of sprinkle, but we're coming upon a uh, your shop down here. Mm -hmm. 
It's a very interesting shop. Uh, I can tell already something about the walls. It's stucco, but there's a secret. There is, yes. I built the shop in uh, 97 uh, when we moved here, and it's a straw bale structure. So the, all the exterior walls are stacked up straw bales that we've stuccoed over it. And um, it's, it's a terrific shop. Uh, you know, it's quiet for the neighbors. Uh, it heats and cools really well, and it's just really comfortable. Oh, now, it's still fun. a shop, you know, kind of unfinished and everything else, but uh, yeah. Well, how did you get here? Oh my, uh, so um, I was raised Navy, uh, so I grew up all over the place, but dad um, retired about the time I hit high school age, and that was in Western Michigan. Uh, so came from a, you know, a working class family, and you know, you're expected basically to get out of high school and start to work. And I was actually in a plumbing shop at that time, uh, about to get my journeyman's license, and I just couldn't take it. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. And so I, I got rid of everything that I had, and I was a big cyclist at the time. And I hopped on my bicycle, and I was going to tour the country, and I ended up stuck in Tennessee, and I loved it since. Well, what a lovely place to, to end up. And it looks like you're firmly established here. Well, let's get out of the rain. And Scott, uh, what interested you about shops and woodworking? How did you get started? Well, well, I'm a product of a high school that still had a very strong industrial arts wing. Um, you know, and like I said, I came from a working class uh, blue collar family. And um, so that, that was really important to me. Made we, sense to you. It absolutely did. We had a yeah. strong woodworking program, a metals mm -hmm. you know, program there, and a drafting. Uh, studio that you know I took years of, of all of those and, and it just gave me a good foundation it wasn't you know extensive by any stretch of the imagination but uh, it was a foundation well we were going to look at the start of your door project for Aramont sure yeah sure. can yeah. you show me absolutely so I got a call from an architect uh, Don Horton who um, has been working with Aramont to uh, tighten up their their uh, campus, um, you know, efficiency-wise. And one of the things that he wanted to do was change the, the front doors out. And so we had the conversation, and he uh, sent me an idea, and that's where we went from there. Uh, now, Aramont hmm. is an arts and crafts school, is that correct? It is, and it, it was actually quite influential for me, because when I first moved to Gatlinburg, I rented a little tiny room in the back of this lady's house, and that house was about a stone's throw away from Aramont. So even though you know I had this sort of foundation in you know from my high school years, Aramont really opened my eyes to what craft could really be. You were sort of planted into the culture. Yeah. Yeah. What what a wonderful, inspiring way to uh, to further your your passions there so uh, these are going to represent for Aramont an entry into their world of arts and crafts yeah 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 and the the architect's idea and it's not high art but we want to represent solid craft in it mm -hmm. you know and doors uh, Charles can be tough you know you're asking a door to do an awful lot uh, you're going to put it on a couple of pins, and you're going to ask it to be stable mm -hmm. and not move yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and function in and out, day, day in and day out. That's right. And so uh, when you're building a door structurally, uh, there's a lot of um, things that are really important to keep in mind. And one of those is the choice of the materials that you use. And like I set up at the house, you know, aesthetically, matching grain is important to me, but structurally, the way mm -hmm. this thing has to stick together is mm -hmm. important. And you want to highlight uh, the artsy part here. We and, do have and, this motif yeah. of the uh, of the mountains here to represent, you know, the the area that we're in. Uh -huh. uh, and these will be kind of laid up. They're kind of laid up like so. And yeah. we're still working on the finishing materials on this. I'm thinking maybe milk paint. Mm -hmm. might be an appropriate uh, 
uh, yeah. finish on those. But the core, the, the styles and the rails uh, and the fitting of it all has to, you know, be, be really solid. It, which ties into that clean aspect mm -hmm. that uh, I talked to you about. You're going to show me how to, to build it cleanly? Absolutely, Charles. Um, as you can see right here, these are the styles of the doors. And to have that consistent of graining uh, and the, the board, the styles, as straight and true as possible, and then to maintain that trueness, not to have any twisting or warping or anything, I built a core up. Um, and so you can see here what I've done on the core is I've taken flats on wood, ripped it, flipped them 90 degrees, and then glued them together so that I'm essentially creating a quarter sawn timber. And then I will find uh, timbers that I like the graining on, I'll resaw them, keep them thick veneers, and then press them onto the faces of it. So the, the door is not only beautiful with the grain, it's very, very stable. Structurally sound, absolutely. Wow. It'll really minimizing the twist and all. And of course you have to continue that with the, um, with the rails as well. And so I've got the rails laid out here, um, the bottom one, as wide as it is, we wanted to do a double tenon on that, haunch tenon on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's the same construction. You and know? so you're working the core just like you would work a solid timber. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah you're constructing your cores and basically you're making the piece of wood that you want to work with. And you've got your mortises and your tenons. Mm -hmm. And uh, this piece over here, it looks like a practice piece? It is, it is. You know, uh, because you're a jobbing shop, you don't have the um, advantages of doing things over and over again. Each job, uh, you got to make sure that you're on, on your game. And so on something like this, I will do a practice piece as I go along, just to make sure my setups are tight and my mortise and tenons are going to be, uh, you know, to the tolerances that I want. Now. This is a question that we have talked about before. How tight should the uh, mortise and tenon joint be? Well, I'm going to quote Alf Sharp on this, who quotes somebody else who has uh, asked I'm the sure. same question. Yes. And Alf Sharp replied that the tenon, if you were to place the tenon um, above the mortise, it should not drop in. But you should be able to pound it in with your hat. <laughs> with your hat. That yes. sounds like an Al Sharp. It is. But you know he stole it from somebody. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. But a reliable source, no doubt. Oh, yes. Now, you have uh, a sled that you made up specifically for cutting those tenons. Is that right? Yeah, let me show you that over here on the table saw. All right, I want to see it. Okay, so this is a sled that I made um, yesterday, actually, just to cut these tenons. A fresh sled. I make them all the time. Yeah. Everybody ought to know how to make a sled quickly and efficiently right. and accurately uh, because they're just so useful. Now, a tenon this size, you know, you can cut a tenon a dozen different ways, but a tenon this size and to keep it accurate, to keep that door absolutely square, uh, you've got to keep where your references in mind. And I want my references on this to be flat against this table. I didn't want to be cutting this tenon like this, like a tenon cutter. Okay, it's too big for that. So I'm using a dado blade and I'm using uh, the sled and I'm going to flip it back and forth and so that also tells me that my tenon is exactly in the same center, in the center. Okay, so it's not going to be one side or the other, it's going to be right dead center. And I can raise my blade to get my uh, thickness of my tenon exactly where I want it, which is just a little bit oversized and I'll go back with the shoulder plane and true them up. Oh yeah, and this will give you zero clearance. Your fibers will be supported. There won't be tear Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Yeah, the, uh, the basics. The basics, yes. Yeah. Very important. That's how you keep the clean work you do, I yeah. think. Yeah. yeah. And so keeping your references in mind, this has to be consistent, obviously, you know, throughout the door. Uh, and the middle tenon is a little bit different. So you need some mechanism to be able to dial in that exact measurement. Okay. And since my references are going to be from the outside, um, all of these are the, the top and bottom are the same length and I'm going to use a, a stop at the end here. And I like these little stops like this. It's not digital. It doesn't have to be, does it? <laughs> doesn't have to be. Absolutely not. <laughs> and so I, I position this little screw, you know, to where it'll hit 
the end of my tenon even if I step it up this way so that I can do the shoulders all the way around. Wow. And um, then we just flip it, do the other side, and I'll start with the screw a little bit proud of where my line is, and then I'll just dial it in until I get the exact interior dimensions on my rails. Sneaking up on it. Sneaking up on it. All right. Yep. Well, Scott, what kind of projects are you working on for the future? Because I, I know you. You've always got something. Yeah, I got a few irons in the fire. Yeah. Um, and, you know, most of the work, like I've said, is, is kind of uh, very, very client driven. But I do have a little bit of a passion project that I work on that's just, right. you know, mine. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not big art piece or anything like that. It's more of a concept piece. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a piece that's in service of things, of something, I think. And I think it, it kind of comes out of all the work that I did with churches. So it's what a furniture maker and designer can bring to the service of ritual. I see. And I've had a, a, an, an issue with memorial services, Charles. There are more and more of them. A there lot of people are choosing cremation. Yes, and that's the point where I had issues with. Well, you're kind of in a family way about it, aren't you? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> All right. And this is the family cabinet. Oh, how about that? <laughs> yes, and it's gone through several, you know, iterations. Um, and the first pieces were kind of concept pieces, and they were speculative, and they were targeted towards possibly uh, individual owners. But I backed away from that and the pieces that I'm designing now, I'm designing specifically for funeral homes to use. So it's a piece of uh, infrastructure, you know, in their facilities that they can use time and time again. So something was missing. Yes. And that was? Well, you know, I had been to funeral services and memorial services, what I should say, celebrations of life, because they're different, you know, than a, a visitation you know, or open casket kind of visitation and service thing. This yes. is different. And when I would go to these, I would walk into the room and it was difficult at times to find the urn. You know, people did not know how to present it. And, you know, the go-to thing, of course, is to get a table and you put a nice covering on it and you place the urn there. Maybe you elevate it a little bit and then you put some, um, uh, things that were important to that person around, you know, family pictures and that sort of thing. But the thing that occurred to me was that they were using the wrong piece of furniture. A table is a work surface, but a cabinet, a cabinet is where we put the things that we value, want to protect and show off. And so in my design, shifting from that table concept to a cabinet concept, uh, was kind of pivotal and so I've come up with three styles of family cabinets that I'm offering to funeral homes right now and I know it's kind of an odd legacy but I'd be alright with it. Later in the show we'll head back to Scott's unique workshop and learn how to make a table saw crosscut sled from scratch. But first, working on a stool Popular Woodworking Magazine has a tip that will make you want to take a closer look at your legs. Stay with us. You're watching The Highland Woodwork. I'm just an average down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm probably about a 5. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here. And I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw. And there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop.
Meet the Bora Centipede, the lightweight and portable workshop table that supports up to 3,000 pounds, stores in a small space for tight shops, and opens into a work table to bring your work to a comfortable height. This makes the perfect companion for your track saw. Comes with X cups and hold downs to secure your work. Just add the Boro workbench top and you've got a great auxiliary table anywhere in your shop. Upgrade your shop today. I've been using Forest products for years. You know, they're the maker of the Woodworker 2 saw blade gives great cuts on your table saw every time. Now, I have a chop master for my miter saw. I have a dense piece of two by two walnut, and as you see, it cuts like butter, leaving clean cuts at 90 degrees. Forest, the cuts will make you smile every time. Well, I've just finished this little walnut stool, but I still have a few more things to do to it. And one of them is I need to pay a little attention to an unlikely place, the bottom of the legs. Now, the reason I need to pay attention to the bottom of the legs is that I need to flatten them. And I want to do that for two reasons. One is, if I flatten the bottom of my legs, it'll be a little gentler to the floor. I won't leave divots in linoleum or perhaps chip the finish. Second is, if all the weight on the stool comes down on a thin exterior edge of my legs, well, I'm more likely to have chipping and cracking in that area. So for the protection of our floors, the protection of the bottom of the legs, it's a good idea to flatten them. Well, flattening couldn't be easier. I've got my stool up on, a, on the bench, and I've put down a little piece of 80 grit PSA paper. And so I'm just going to rub each leg uh, quite a bit until I get a nice smooth bottom. I'll check my progress. It looks like I'm about halfway there, so I still have a little more to do. Now, after I finish flattening everything down completely, I want to take a little sandpaper and around these corners. And once again, that is to prevent chipping. So there you go. If you make a stool or a chair, spend a little time where you can't see. The bottom of the legs will be better for your floors and prevent chipping, give longer life to your furniture. Well, these are a few of the clamps that I have for different things, but even these clamps, many of them have been upgraded and there are new models that can do a better job. I'm gonna show you a new model of a clamp that is really just the best of clamp technology, if you will. Woodworkers have been using bar clamps for years to put together panels and to do other things. This would be a panel of five boards here. Um, bar clamps have improved tremendously. Uh, these non-slip parallel bar clamps with a pivoting handle, <laughs> they're just the thing and you're going to want them just like me to replace some of those old bar clamps. Let me show you what they can do first. To me, this is the hook. I can tighten these up and they've got a great handle. First of all, just using it in the normal position right here, you can slide it up and start tightening. Look how easy it slides up. And we'll start tightening up. And what I'm seeing is because 
they have parallel jaws, we've got a great situation here for clamping boards together. These don't have any biscuits or any dowels or, or any dominoes. And look how flat they are. That's because they have absolutely parallel jaws that aren't pushing them up or out. They're just pushing them directly together. These are parallel. That is the first thing I expect from a bar clamp. Let me show you something else that they do. The handles are really unique. First of all, they're covered in a rubberized plastic. They feel good and you can actually grip them easily. Now, if you want to change the position, you can rotate them around like this. And <laughs> watch this. If you need to really crank down and push your boards together, then this is the clamp for you. Look at that. All right. Yeah, all you have to do is twist the little collar and tighten it up. If you need any more pressure than the 1,500 pounds you can get with one of these clamps, you really need to use something else to put your, your panel together. Uh, what a great clamping system. And because of the parallel jaws again, it is mighty smooth. Now, let me take the boards away and I'll show you a few other things that you're going to like. Well, you're probably wanting to know what this non-slip is about. Well, all of us have picked up clamps before and watched it slide down. And if you had your hand right here, <laughs> you may have been pinched. This doesn't happen. Look at that control. That is a great clamp. Now, when you buy these, what I would say to do is put a nice little coat of some wax here to protect them so the glue won't stick on your, your rail here. And there's something else you get that I think is really nice. It seems like they've thought of everything, and I think they have. We've got some 1 8 inch standoffs here. Uh, in case you don't want your panel to lay across the bar itself, um, you also have these non-mar faces uh, that do a, just a beautiful job. And if you want to use the clamp as a spreader, you can take this off, uh, pull the head off, turn it around, put it back on, and then you can take something apart. Uh, everything has been thought of in this new bar clamp. I'm gonna have to get two, four, eight. Yeah, I need to replace my whole collection. This is the way to go. It comes in a number of sizes and they are going to make you smile. Coming up, sledding with Scott DeWard. You're watching The Highland Woodworld. Whiteside Machine Company has been in business for over 30 years providing customers with quality router bits. Fine Woodworking Magazine has declared Whiteside Router Bits best overall and best value when compared against 17 other brands. No matter the router application, they have the type and profile of carbide router bit you need. When you put a white side router bit to work in your shop, it is guaranteed to make you smile. There's four words that Lee Tools lives by. Four words that mean quality joinery to take your projects to the next level. Whether it's dovetails, box joints, or mortise and tenon. And we'll even help you clean up. 
Those four words, better tools, better results. Highland Woodworking stocks a wide selection of Rikon power tools known for their innovative design and rugged durability. Highland has sold thousands of Rikon's industry-leading bandsaws with sizes to fit every woodworking need, from the compact affordable 10-inch model to competitively priced 14 and 18-inch models. Shop us also for Rikon's reliable planers, lathes, and professional low-speed grinder, all with an exceptional five-year warranty. Rikon. Power tools. If you can't make it to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia, you can shop online at highlandwoodworking.com. They're great at getting what you want to your shop quick. Let Highland's legendary wood slicer resaw blade help make it easy for you to get great results sawing thick lumber into thinner boards. The wood slicer is designed to cut much faster, smoother, and quieter than ordinary bandsaw blades. You'll be amazed at how smooth a surface you'll get with a wood slicer. Its variable tooth pattern greatly reduces noise and vibration. Order a wood slicer from Highland Woodworking for your bandsaw today. To do good work, it's imperative that you know how to build and then use effectively uh, a, a sled. And I want to see how you do it. There are lots and lots of woodworkers that need this instruction. Well, there's a lot of different ways to make them as well, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that everyone should have the foundations of making a sled and knowing how to use them. Yeah. So let's go ahead and make one. All right, let's do it. Okay, so I prepped some material here. This is going to be my fence on the uh, little block that I cut off of that, mm -hmm. you know, and I generally keep a uh, stock of these around. Once I cut them, I, I just keep a little stack up by my saw blades because I'm always making sleds for different reasons, okay? And uh, these, of course, slide in your miter slots. And I generally use two of them. And if you'll notice, these are just slightly under yeah, the depth of my miter slots. Sure. But we got to get them above. Yeah. I'm going to drop some pennies down in there. And that's going to bump them up just a bit. And I've moved my fence over to the uh, amount of space that I want on the right of my blade. Okay. Okay. And I'll drop those in there. Now you can see that they are just slightly just above. Just proud. Yeah. Just proud. Okay. And I like to have it to where I show my... Um, my strips down here just visually of course you're going to have the the cut in there but when you're referencing it's nice to see those um, and then i'll take real quick give me a little bit of a reference here there and there and i'd like to glue them but be sparse with the glue uh, because what you're going to find is that little bit of glue is going to swell up and it's going to make it a bit tighter in your miter gauge, which is fine. Okay. Uh, I'd rather be a little bit too tight than too loose because I can easily grab a cabinet scraper and shave yeah. off what I need to have that perfect fit. Yeah, that's the beauty of using uh, wood miter sleds as opposed to those metal ones you buy that uh, you have to make some fine adjustments and then you get a little bit of wobble and what do you do? You can't adjust them. So. Yeah, you got those little plastic things oh, that you got to yeah, put a screw yeah. in there. Nah, I'd just rather go ahead and... Uh, and of course this is three quarter which is what I usually like to use but sometimes I use half. Mm -hmm. So one inch nails now will get me already set without going through. So it's nice and quick. Nice and quick. Yeah, I like that. And then I'll flip it and even put a couple this way. And, you know, I'm not, I can get to work right away and the glue will set up. Because uh, you want to use it while it's fresh. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so get rid of my And if pens. you want to build a more expensive model, you can use dimes. Ooh, yeah. 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 But nickels are too big. Oh, well. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so 
that's quick and easy right there. And we're going to be on spot there. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to set my fence here. I'm going to see about where I want it. And because, you know, I'll probably crank up the blade pretty high at times, I'm going to have a block back here as well. So I'll use that as sort of a measurement. So right about there is where I'm going to stop my blade. Okay. And that's still going to be, actually, I'm going to go up a little bit more because I want some more meat back here. You know, just give me a little mark there. Now I will raise my blade. Now referencing the slot has always been sort of an issue. It uh, is. So I found that if I just put my ruler in there and then I use some wedges, just lightly, I can stabilize it to the point where I can, I just like these little plastic triangles. But before you use the plastic triangle, do test it. Okay, so uh, lay it up against your straight edge, scribe your line, flip it, lay it up against it that way, and then make sure you're spot on. That's great. Yeah, I like okay. it. Okay, so now I'm going to bring it down, and I'll take, uh, what do you call this, a fence? Sure. Okay, I don't know, sometimes you don't know what to call things, you just don't know what, the, you know what they do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and um, I'll bring it here, and I'll just put a screw in one end. Mm-hmm. Now I've got a pivot, and I can be, take my time and get this spot on. And sometimes I really take my time on this. Well, it's setting your reference. And, yes. And the reference is what it's all about when you're trying to get square. I do want a couple of screws in the center here. On each side here. And I'm going to put one. Okay, back on track here. And you can see that this is starting to stiffen up a little bit. That's that glue being absorbed in the... In Causing the, the fibers to swell a little Just bit. Just a little bit. Yeah. But I know I've got a good reference there. I'm coming back here. I'll slide it both directions, make sure. And then because screws will tend to make things move, mm -hmm. I'll put a clamp here before I put a screw in. I may just use a scraper here. And if you move it back and forth sometimes, you can see where they're rubbing. And usually, there's like a little dot, little rub mark 
right where each of those little drops of glue would have been. But just a quick pass or two with a scraper. And wooden slides like this, you're always going to be tweaking them. But it doesn't take long, and the accuracy and convenience of them is just real good. Then I'll And that's that's basically it. Yeah, and that's there for safety to keep your yeah your fingers out of it. And yeah. a quick stop, you know, is um, you know just a block like so. And I like to undercut them like that so that when there's clamped in there, you don't have dust go. that that builds up in it and pushes yeah. it the the wrong way. Yeah. And you know this is this is woodworking 101. Yeah. But. It's still like, um, it takes a while to master, you know, just mm -hmm. the basics, but when you can be confident in each of the steps that you make, yeah. then your woodworking just kind of benefits from it all. This is great. Thank you so much. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode of the Highland Woodworker. Be sure to check us out on social media, and until next time, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker. <laughs>